Hello, this is Dr. Alex Vasquez, and what I'd like to do in this quick video is introduce you to one of my favorite topics, which is dysbiosis. Dysbiosis is often referred to as a chronic or subclinical infection, and these are often triggers for inflammatory conditions and autoimmune diseases. So what I'd like to do in this quick video is just introduce you to some basic vocabulary terms and concepts. I've written several articles on this topic, uh, and I've also written extensively about it in my uh, textbook, Integrative Rheumatology. Uh, my background is that of a doctor of naturopathic medicine, doctor of chiropractic, and doctor of osteopathic medicine. And my book, Integrative Rheumatology, is available through my website, OptimalHealthResearch.com, and also other bookstores such as Amazon.com. So what is dysbiosis? My definition of dysbiosis is that it is a relationship of non-acute, non-infectious, host microorganism interaction that adversely affects the human host. So let me say that one more time. Dysbiosis is a relationship of non-acute, non-infectious, host microorganism interaction that adversely affects the human host. It generally does not have signs of infection, so there's no fever, there's no redness, there's no swelling, and there's no acute uh, lymph gland, uh, hyperplasia, hypertrophy. The location of the active dysbiosis often has no signs or symptoms, no symptoms or manifestations, or such findings are nonspecific. For example, many patients with gastrointestinal dysbiosis have no major clinical GI manifestations, just as patients with sinorespiratory or genitourinary dysbiosis do not present with manifestations of an acute uh, upper respiratory infection or urinary tract infection, respectively. So. Because of the rather nonspecific presentation of dysbiotic uh, conditions, uh, a lot of physicians have overlooked these problems and they've been more difficult to diagnose because it's hard to tell sometimes where the infection or the dysbiosis is actually occurring. Sometimes it's in the gastrointestinal tract, sometimes it's in the genitourinary tract, sometimes it's in the sinuses or the throat. And so it takes a clinician who's familiar with these concepts to be able to decipher the rather subtle signs and symptoms that might be presenting clinically, and to come to an accurate assessment of the patient, and then to implement the appropriate treatment and follow up accordingly. So dysbiosis, because of its very nature, has remained somewhat enigmatic, even though it's been discussed in the medical literature now for over 100 years. So let's uh, look at some more details on this topic of dysbiosis. Dysbiosis has been discussed in the biomedical literature for over 100 years, as I just mentioned. It was first really detailed in a textbook by Elie Metchnikoff called The Prolongation of Human Life. This was published in 1908, and since then, approximately 200 articles have been published uh, that specifically use the term dysbiosis. Other terms related to dysbiosis, or which dysbiosis might be discussed under, are dysbacteriosis, which is sometimes used in some of the European literature. Autointoxication was a popular term also in the earlier part of uh, the century in about uh, 19, in the 1930s, 1940s, auto intoxication was a popular term then. A more recognized, more recent term lately is called dermatitis arthritis syndrome. Short bowel syndrome is another phrase that's commonly associated with dysbiosis. Bacterial overgrowth of the small bowel, which is commonly seen, for example, in patients with fibromyalgia, is also a form of dysbiosis. Mucosal colonization and subclinical infections are also names that are applicable to this phenomenon of dysbiosis. Uh, clinical associations with dysbiosis include autoimmunity of nearly all types, chronic unwellness, whether that's chronic fatigue syndrome or what's sometimes referred to as chronic fatigue immune dysfunction syndrome, fibromyalgia, as I already mentioned, many of those patients have bacterial overgrowth of the small bowel. Same thing is true of patients with irritable bowel syndrome. And a lot of patients who have other immune disorders like allergy often have uh, subclinical and undiagnosed dysbiosis. When we clear out the dysbiotic uh, situation, then those patients often experience improvement. Many medically unexplained and idiopathic disorders and syndromes are also either caused by or contributed to, um, in, at least in part, by dysbiosis. Uh, interestingly enough, hypertension and diabetes also have a dysbiotic component to them, as does uh, cardiovascular disease in general. So the interesting thing about dysbiosis is that patients often have unique inflammatory and metabolic responses to the dysbiotic microorganisms that they're exposed to or that they might harbor, again, on their skin or in their sinuses or their gastrointestinal tract.
Remember, we're not looking for classic infection here. We're looking to determine which underlying disruptions may be exacerbating inflammation in the patient's symptomatology, especially when we're working with autoimmune conditions. We have to look beyond the disease-associated characteristics of the microbe to see the patient's individualized response to that microbe or the group of microbes that they're harboring. Dysbiosis in one patient may present with dermatitis, while what appears to be the same microbial imbalance in another patient can present as peripheral neuropathy or inflammatory arthritis. Often what we find when we're working with patients with autoimmune and inflammatory disorders is that they are having a pathogenic inflammatory response to a non-pathogenic microbe. So that's, in my opinion, one of my best explanations of what dysbiosis is. So let's look at that sentence one more time. Often what we find when working with autoimmune and inflammatory patients is that they are having a pathogenic inflammatory response to a non-pathogenic microbe. We'll look at that again in a few more examples, but that's a critical point to uh, keep in our minds as we discuss dysbiosis. It's not so much the nature of the microorganism itself. It is how is that microorganism influencing the patient's immune system and the immune response and to what extent is it creating a metabolic imbalance or an inflammatory disorder uh, that wouldn't otherwise exist there unless it were for this uh, microbial trigger. So in the course of studying dysbiosis over the last several years, I've developed some terminology that I want to introduce on this slide. Uh, and this work is all very well uh, substantiated by the biomedical literature. I just happen to have studied it very intensely, and I happen to have compiled a lot of data around this, so I have some unique concepts to share with you. Let's talk about locations of dysbiosis. There are seven locations for dysbiosis. These are gastrointestinal, which is one of the more common forms of dysbiosis that we see, orodental dysbiosis, so people can have subclinical infections within their mouth that they're not even aware of, Sinorespiratory infections are very common as well. Uh, parenchymal infections, one of the more uh, common ones that we see these days is either like hepatitis C, so he subclinical hepatitis C, even though that's a legitimate infection, a lot of times those patients will present with an arthritis or a fatigue-related syndrome. Their liver enzymes will be normal, so we don't suspect that they have hepatitis, but if we test them appropriately, we find that they do have that. Uh, there's another microorganism that actually lives intracellularly. It's called Chlamydophila pneumoniae, and that's also been associated with some fatigue-related syndromes and some autoimmune conditions as well. We now have new testing parameters for that uh, as of just this year in 2011. Uh, genitourinary dysbiosis is very common. We often see that in women who have uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Cutaneous dysbiosis is common in patients who have psoriasis and eczema. And environmental dysbiosis describes a phenomenon wherein patients are exposed to microbial byproducts such as volatile organic uh, compounds from those microbes, and those compounds influence their immune system and cause an inflammatory imbalance leading to the development of an autoimmune condition. When the patients are removed from that microbial exposure, their autoimmune disease often either disappears or goes into remission. So we have good evidence of a cause and effect relationship there. Some of the more problematic microbes that I've seen in my clinical practice include uh, Aeromonas hydrophila, Blastocystis hominis, Candida albicans, and other yeast, Citrobacter rhododendrum, also called Citrobacter frundii, Diantamoeba fragilis, Indolimax nana, uh, Intamoeba histolytica, Gamma strep is another very common one that we see. Uh, also, uh, Enterococcus can overgrow in the intestines and cause uh, dermatitis arthritis syndrome. Giardia lamblia has been associated with a uh, reactive arthritis as well. Hafnia alvei, uh, Helicobacter pylori is associated not only with migraine headaches but also with Sjogren syndrome. Uh, Klebsiella pneumoniae, of course, is associated with the autoimmune condition ankylosing spondylitis. Proteus mirabilis is associated with rheumatoid arthritis. Pseudomonas aeruginosa, I've seen that in patients who have autoimmune conditions affecting their nervous system. Staphylococcus aureus, uh, Staphylococcus epidermidis, and Staphylococcus pyogenes and group A streptococci as well have all been associated with autoimmune phenomenon. Some of the mechanisms that are involved with uh, these inflammatory conditions associated with microbial infections include uh, molecular mimicry, superantigen uh, formation and release, enhanced processing of autoantigens, bystander activation, peptidoglycans and endotox, exotoxins, that is, exotoxins from gram-positive bacteria, 
endotoxins from gram-negative bacteria, immunostimulation by bacterial DNA, activation of toll-like receptors in NF-kappa B, immune complex deposition uh, following the formation of those immune complexes, of course, is also very commonly seen in patients who have dysbiosis, haptinization and neoantigen formation, damage to the intestinal mucosa, which exacerbates all of the above, uh, and also causes an alteration in detoxification pathways. Certain anti-metabolites can be formed, such as uh, D-lactic acid, for example. Autointoxication, hepatic encephalopathy, and intestinal arthritis dermatitis syndrome, those are all names for the same condition, which is uh, bacterial overgrowth of the small bowel. Some patients just become more sensitive to that once their physiology has been altered by uh, other, other situations. Uh, impairment of mucosal and systemic defenses, for example, candida albicans produces a mycotoxin, which suppresses immune function. It also produces an IgA protease, which actually degrades IgA on mucosal surfaces, thereby resulting in the, uh, we could say, accumulation and persistence of microbial infections and uh, colonization on the mucosal surface. Impairment of mucosal digestion by microbial proteases and, and uh, local inflammation. And finally, inflammation-induced endocrine dysfunction, I believe, also plays a role here, even though the research on that's a little less solid than it is for the uh, previously mentioned molecular mechanisms of dysbiosis. So as I've diagrammed this in my integrative rheumatology textbook, you can see that a lot of these individual uh, molecular mechanisms actually coalesce or merge, we could say, into final common pathways that we see clinically. So patients don't come in and say, hey, I've got dysbiosis. They come in and they say, hey, I've got muscle fatigue, my joints hurt, or that we do a test and we find out they've got systemic inflammation, or we do another test and we find out they've got immune complex deposition in their arteries and their vascular system and their kidneys. And what we see when we look at the pathways that lead to those final clinical manifestations, we see that a lot of these pathways merge from the uh, original bacterial products, let's say. So if a patient has, let's say, bacterial overgrowth of a small bowel, they're producing uh, an excess of endotoxins and exotoxins in their gastrointestinal tract along with bacterial DNA, along with superantigens, some of which uh, participate in this phenomenon called molecular mimicry. And all of these things can kind of coalesce, as you see in this rather simplified diagram, uh, into what we see clinically, which again are these syndromes of pain, inflammation, and uh, joint inflammation as well. So that's how we can use this approach that I've described in the integrative rheumatology textbook to understand what's going on clinically with our patients and to help address the underlying problem. Again, and you can see in this diagram, which is appropriately so, this is obviously a, a woman uh, in this image, most autoimmune conditions affect women more so than they do men. And I just want to reiterate uh, what I've already said and also give you some examples of conditions where this has been very well established. Often what we find when working with autoimmune and inflammatory patients is that they're having a pathogenic inflammatory response to a non-pathogenic microbe. The conditions that this has been documented in include systemic lupus erythematosus, rheumatoid arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, Wergener's granulomatosis, uh, Sjogren syndrome, psoriasis in particular, very good research there, and dermatomyositis and polymyositis. So rather than seeing this female patient in this example and saying, gosh, she's got this inflammatory syndrome, what can we do other than suppress the inflammation with these anti-inflammatory drugs? We could look at that same patient and say, okay, what's causing her immune system to be imbalanced in such a way that it's resulting in this inflammatory condition? And then what can we do to get rid of that underlying trigger? That's the approach that we use in naturopathic medicine. That's the approach that we use in functional medicine. And that's the approach that I advocate and describe in my book so that we're addressing the underlying problem, not simply masking the problem by using immune suppressing drugs. The immune system is not the problem. The immune system is responding appropriately to an underlying trigger. The question is, what's the trigger and what can we do to get rid of it so that the immune system begins to function normally again and stops destroying, uh, as we often see, the body's tissues, which is, of course, one of the hallmarks of autoimmune diseases, especially lupus, which is a uh, body-wide systemic inflammatory autoimmune condition.
which causes damage to the heart, the vessels, the kidneys, the joints, the skin, and even the brain and other organs as well. So again, rather than looking at those patients and saying, gosh, your immune system isn't functioning, we need to suppress it uh, in order to stop this inflammatory response, let's look at asking what is the underlying trigger causing the response and what can we do to get rid of that? And dysbiosis is a big part of that. So again, thank you for uh, paying attention to this rather short video uh, on dysbiosis, which again is a very, very fascinating topic. That's why I ended up uh, writing a book on it a few years ago called Integrative Rheumatology. Um, and in this book, I discuss dysbiosis as one of the five major triggers of chronic inflammation and autoimmune dis disorders. Again, this has been Dr. Alex Vasquez. My books are available at OptimalHealthResearch.com and also Amazon.com and other bookstores. Thanks for your attention, and I hope you find this information useful.